Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the first Elias V Fishing Podcast pilot. Currently out of work due to Florence and I'm waiting to go back home. Wednesday's forecast forced my girlfriend and I to evacuate due to flooding. She has two horses on her property and 20 to 30 inches of rain would have caused deadly flooding and that would have been catastrophic as these are not seahorses. So this podcast is something I wanted to do as an off-the-cuff project that would not attract the typical clickbaity nor trolling audience associated with YouTube. It's actually an opportunity for me to address specific questions that I really don't address in videos. I'll be bringing in different guests for each episode to talk about various subjects like tackle, specific fisheries, kayaks, etc. And this is supposed to be unscripted and supposed to be a lot of fun. It's also going to be pretty informational as well. So if you do enjoy these podcasts, please let me know. I have a Patreon link in the description where you can make a video, where you can make a donation after the end of the video or podcast rather and if the reception is not good after a few attempts i'm going to discontinue this so it's um, we're, we're trying to it's a work in progress a pet project of mine so to say so on this episode without further ado i adju- introduce you to my first guest the tackle guru tackle advisors wow wow am i honored <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we have to make this really good because we're i'm going to probably record three or four of these and people hate it and we're just done so you know i would like to get started by just saying you introducing yourself, um, what you do differently, and I will tell why I think you are so important to the fishing community. But go ahead. Wait, are we live? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I appreciate the intro. That was that was yeah, very kind of you to invite me on the podcast. Uh, I, I have a feeling this is uh, going to be a pretty cool format because you don't see much of this kind of thing on uh, the YouTube's. It's a lot of uh, teeny bopper, a lot of you know, misinformation out there. Uh, a lot of people that do the YouTube fishing thing, they don't put out content that you can really learn from and benefit from your time spent. And uh, there are guys out there like you, Tactical Bastin, uh, C Money, and a couple other guys. It's, it, it's you know it's a very small niche of quality content out there. And you, you mentioned that I do things a little bit differently, and that's uh, you know my approach isn't to be a live vicariously through me fishing channel. Uh, it's more or less to help people. Um, protect their wallets from the people that are trying to reach into and take their money from dishonest advertising and there's a lot of stuff out there and it's very confusing so when people watch me uh, it's you know every review I do it's based on 30 years of fishing experience and I'm not just a bass fisher not just a trout fisher I'm not just a striper fisher I'm not just a tuna fisher I'm, I'm everywhere in between too so So what I think is so significant about you is for we're going through different eras of tackle purchasing and tackle information. For a while, we had uh, websites like tackle. I think it was tackle review, maybe tackle uh, tackle tour. Tackle tour. Do you remember them? They're they're not as big anymore, are they? Well, I mean, it's 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 a different getting information is, is different now. I mean, websites like tackle tour forums in general are not as popular. Media is being consumed differently. Right. So, so I, re- I remember Tackle Tour for a little while, and they gave everything a wonderful review. I remember that. Everything was a great purchase. But they still gave you good detailed information, and that was a thing for a while. Yeah, you know, I loved them. I, I was a longtime member on their forum until they banned me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, was that what you're trying to get me to say? <laughs> no, but, 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 but now we're in the age of, of like, pro staff shilling and, oh, like, God. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to like what I love for you that you do is that no one else does is that it's unbiased. You get your revenue from non tackle companies, so you don't have to really beg them for you know reels or money or anything, and you can provide real information back to the, the public. And without... you know, not to interrupt you, but for the last year and a half, a lot of my content came from subscribers. I had no idea who these people were. I would have a gentleman by the name of uh, Scott Hagbert all the way out in California would send me a $500 abu on top of a $300 reel on top of a $200 reel. And he'd give me them before he even used them. He would buy them with the shipping address to my house. And I, that's overwhelming. And the fact that 20 other people were doing that, like we're talking somebody bought a uh, a four hundred dollar Shimano Altegra Longcast CI four reel, along with a, and then somebody else sent a Sustain, which is a three hundred dollar reel, and sent it in the same box as a six hundred dollar Shimano Essence. 
he only used one of the reels. He just bought the six hundred dollar essence. Never even got a chance to use it, and it was shipped directly to me. And for the last year and a half, that's a lot of the content that I was putting out was based on product being sent by viewers. So that's it amazing. worked to my advantage because at no point in time was I owing any tackle company anything, or any shop, and, or any right. You were you were doing it all on your own accord, and you still are. And you know you you've put out some amazing content, you know, dissecting different types of reels and. What I think is amazing is that, what's that? Comparis comparisons are key. It's usually not just one box, you know, being shown and whatever's in it, and is that that's what it is. A lot of times, I'm bringing in multiples, like right. Shimano versus Daiwa. Right, and right. you understand how a person that actually fishes shops. That a lot of people will have a certain budget or a certain brand. Like that's the, it's the that's the way it seems to go. Is that you, people are either like, okay, I can spend one hundred fifty dollars on a reel with this size, or I'm a pen loyalist, I am a Shimano loyalist, or maybe a, one or two different brands. And you really touch upon th that type of shopper when it comes to fishing reels. And I don't think a lot of people realize that's how some people really want their information consumed. They just, you know, oh, check out this latest and greatest that we're dumping at you at this trade show, you know, and that's it. Then they walk away from it, as opposed to, you know, really giving the, the viewer that information. I know, oh, yeah. I know when we were setting up, you we, we wanted to talk to me about uh, some of my experiences, too. Is, uh, you know, <laughs> since this, is all, this isn't all about me. It's trying to get real information out there, too. Um, you know, for the last year and a half, sorry, for the past year, I've been, I switched over from somebody who helped me out. Asking. Yeah, task, and I'm not saying the, the people at the first, when I just started getting into this YouTube realm and building up, a, making a living off fishing for a living. Uh, they absolutely helped me out, and, you know, when no one else stepped up to the plate. Last last year and change, I've been using different brands now: Shimano, Tsunami, Daiwa, uh, Pen. Just the last couple of weeks, so I've been go going back to more of the standard, you know, bearers of the of the fishing industry. So, and um, I've been through in the last year. I mean, I would average four days a week fishing, and. I've been through two Daiwa Fuego LTs. The second one is still holding up. Um, I'm on a second Shimano Stratic. Well, the first Shimano Stratic, uh, the line roller bearing failed on me. That's a Shimano Stratic 3000. Yeah, and something like that's almost expected. Right. I mean, line, line rollers are like, you know, clutches and teenager Mustangs. You know, they're, <laughs> they're going to burn through, you know, it's, it's constantly getting soaked because whatever line you're using, the water just goes right in there. And so, I have three I, I, Go ahead. Yeah. I expected you to destroy uh, multiple Fuegos and multiple Stratics because I, I remember that month long trip you spent down in Florida and you're just beating on it. Right. I was, I was rinsing watching, them out in hotel bathrooms. That yeah, was my. Post. I remember I asked you, like, yo, let me get some of that footage of that tarpon video you got with a little freshwater Fuego. I, I couldn't believe that it survived. And then I remember you mentioned that, you know, it kind of locked up on you a little bit. You had to hit it with some grease. And to get it spinning again, and it survived the rest of the trip. I'm like, damn. Right. And people always commented to me that they like the BG better than the Fuego LT. I always just found that I haven't owned a BG in a while, but I've held them recently. And I found the, the weight of the Fuego to be like just a much more better finesse oriented reel for jigging and like light tackle pitching uh, with spinning tackle. But um, aside from that, I've also owned three Tsunami Shields now. And, um, and those are running strong too, aren't they? I wouldn't say they're amazing. They're not. They're definitely not holding up that well. But they definitely can still go out there and catch fish and not if, really if worry about needed, a major failure. If you needed a tool for the job, would that tool still be working and doing the job? Yes, it would still be doing the job. I had one fail on me on a tow tog. Um, it was like an eight pound plus one. After I landed the fish, the reel was done locked up on you or just yeah the clutch is like it, it, I, tsunami replaced it really quickly okay so this that's this last year and change the conventionals i've been using a dial with saltist more or less for a long time see now now back on that on the shield thing that's that's what's interesting about some of these oem companies they don't really service the products so the tsunami shield is not manufactured by tsunami it's manufactured by a company overseas and they slap their name on it and that's that happens with Abu Garcia, Penn, uh, tons of different products. Pure fishing, yeah. So a lot of I don't know if a lot of people listening know. So some companies are you know all in everything's done in their own house, and a lot of them are owned by conglomerates. And uh, yeah, tell tell the average viewer that 
you know, knows a name brand, but really doesn't know what goes on behind the scenes. And I think that's pretty important for somebody to understand. Yeah, and, and continuing off on the, the shield, when you buy a reel like that, if it works, it's good. If you have a problem with it, there's almost a benefit because these companies don't have a parts supply. They don't have a repair department. They don't have a customer service that's going to direct you to the repair department. They're just going to either have you ship the reel in and send a replacement or, sorry, you know, you have to buy a new one, so it's out of warranty. So you're either going to get a, a, a new reel or left in the cold. So it's good in the sense that a lot of times, casting is an example. I get a lot of feedback from guys that, you know, say, oh, you know, I live in the Northeast. I have a problem. Call them, blah, blah, blah. They send me a new reel. And, you know, same thing can be said with that Tsunami Shield. They're, they're tools. They function. They'll do a job. They don't do it as well as you'll, you know, get that, the, the warm, fuzzy feeling with a Shimano or a Daiwa, but they'll get the job done. And, you know, that's why I was asking you, you know, does it, did, does it still perform as a tool used to cast, retrieve, and reel in fish? If it does, then you got your money's worth. And for you, which is part of the reason why I, I, I chose you to send that Penn Spin Fisher live liner, because you're a little bit different. You know, I, I put you in the top 1,000 people that walk or float around on this earth as far as people that will beat the crap out of fishing gear. You know, you're, you're out there four days a week and you're in a kayak, you're surf launching, you're beating on gear. Not to get off on track, you know, get off track, but that's part of the reason why I chose you and why it's, it's almost beneficial to, for people to kind of see what you do with the reel, what you do with the gear. And I kind of wish you would talk more about the products that you're fishing. Because... You see, here's the point where I went to the podcast, too, is that I lose people. But you see, on YouTube, people want to be entertained. Like, if I start getting into details of stuff, people get fucking lost. That's the big problem. <laughs> it's like, I can't talk to you about specifics of, like, too many things because then you fall asleep. I need to keep it entertaining and clickbaity and bullshitty to get the views. So, like, that's kind of like a struggle somebody like me has. That yeah. I, I come from a background yeah. where I understood I fishing. That. I understood where fishing is. And now I'm picking up YouTube trade as I go along and, like, oh... You know, if they don't care that I might understand a couple of different things about, you know, different tests of the line, putting it on a 3000 series spinning reel. They wanted to see me catch and cook a fucking, you know, sample and, and again. Here's, here's a little insight for your audience. The average uh, view duration for both Elias and myself is right around that seven minute mark. So Elias puts out a 10 or 12 minute video, 15 minute video. I put out a 45 minute long video, an hour long video. Still, it comes down to between you know, average seven minutes, you'll have people hanging out, you know, the, notifi the notification squad that really enjoys the content, they'll hang out for the whole duration. Uh, but in reality, the average over all of our views is right around seven minutes. And I get tons of requests asking for like really detailed stuff about how I rig a fish finder up, how am I like, you know, kayak choices, you know, how am I determining when to go out and what kind of weather and lots of really specific stuff that I understand people do want to know. And to me, it makes sense why they want to know. But I think the average person just doesn't give a shit. And it, to them, that's the most boring kind of thing I can talk about. And that's, you know, hence why we're talking here about this kind of stuff right now. So let's, um, I wanted to get back on track a little bit as we were talking about the other reels. And one of the brands we talked about when we, before we even talked about this podcast is that you wanted me to talk a little bit about casking and come a little transparent with them. So I have no bad feelings with the people that run that company. They've been most for the majority, besides the pro staff kids, the actual people that work there have been absolutely professional and great to me. Um, I've had zero issues with um, their marketing director and their CEO. Um, at first, when I just started, you know, getting involved as a guide and YouTubing and all that stuff, they provided me with reels to use. Um, and if, actually, their first generation of reels, and I remember it was called the Casting Orcus. And it was a very basic spinning reel, um, and it worked great. I mean, I landed a 50-pound striper on that reel, man. I'm not going to lie. Um, but the main problem I started having is, like, I settled in on a couple of reels, and I said, I like them. I'm providing them with my fleets. Um, I guess being an OEM brand, they had issues with supply, and they constantly turn over their products and change them every six months um, or three to six months. And that, to me, was very frustrating. That was starting to hurt my credibility as I was saying, this was a great reel. I'm using it and liking it. This, then this reel would get replaced. And that replacement reel might have been total crap for me. And then I started blowing them out one after another after another. So, for example, on a cat, I was telling you how many Daiwas I went through in the year were tsunamis. 
I'd say on average, I would go through on the cast king spinning reels, I'm probably going through one a month. I would average it out if I was fishing actively that month. So a non-winter month. So just to All give right. you an idea. And now what's interesting about that, and, you know, one of the things that I do is, you know, review product. And Peanut Gallery always calls out bias. They always think somebody's opinion is based because they don't like a brand. That's not where I'm coming from when I, when I, when I do my reviews or what I'm going to ask what you what I'm going to ask you right now or, or mention right now. When you fish four days a week, you put a heck of a lot of wear and tear on that reel. Correct. But in the salt water, even if you're a weekend warrior, it's one of those things where you hit that reel with salt. You get salt water up inside the reel, so you dunk it. You fish once, twice, three times, four times a month. That salt water is still going to do its damage. So you're going through a dozen reels a year fishing the way you do somebody uh, who's just weekend. on one setup so then the second set, maybe a close, yeah, i'd say anywhere from a dozen to 20 if you a year somebody like okay. me who, who actively fishes as much as i do i'd be going through a dozen to 20 of those sub 100 dollars reels for sure okay so so now the weekend warrior or the person who can't get out four days a week they're not going to go through 20 but they're not going to go through one either they're still going to have issues correct when but it comes to i'll, I'll tell you one products. of the benefits about this type of casting product at that time when i was working with them a lot more closely i was a guide and i would give out these products for my customers to use if it broke i would not be like if they dunked it you know and like absolutely destroyed it mauled it reeled it against the drag on giant bluefish <laughs> did things that you shouldn't be doing with your fishing tackle Ooh. at the end of the day they dropped it overboard you know, what happens when they drop it overboard? I'm not like, oh, you know, same thing with a regular charter boat cap. Yeah, and that's same. the commercial aspect of it. Yeah, it was so a little like, bit different. Th that is a big appeal that, okay, I'm a sloppy fisherman, or like I break things so quickly, or I'm brand new. So there is that appeal to it. I, like I want to come clean too. That there's absolutely an appeal to sub $100 reels. But to, to start making them an equivalent of, you know, as you say, of the same performance as you'll get as it, of a reel, two to three times and i'm not really following their marketing anymore to see if they still make those claims or if they ever you know i don't think they really make those claims but i think their marketing strategy is more like affordable you know affordable product that um is good for the the, the money spent so i guess in terms of a 60 dollars reel perhaps they have the best performing 60 dollars reel but at the same time my my final opinion lies that you know the hundred dollar reel gives you the better performance for a hundred bucks However, what you do that's amazing is you're comparing the $100 reels because there are a couple of lemons in that mix. If you ask me, the Pen Battle 2, and I always get hosed, I thought the Pen Battle 2 was one of the worst reels I've ever owned. Yeah, that's 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 a rough one right there. Um, and, and again, and, and if you critique Pen, yeah. uh, you, you, you get the backlash from the, the Pen loyalists. Absolutely. And, and right now I'm owning two pens. I have that Pen Slammer 3 that I picked up a month ago, which I think is badass and uh the spin fisher it's nothing like the pen battle that i've owned so you know even if i go off the cuff and say oh fuck that certain pen everyone's still kind of upset with me and every time you know i come up with an opinion of something i get hosed so hard because i get such backlash of from everywhere of, you know i could say i dislike casking or i like casking i'll get a freaking backlash from both it's like just like everything i do so i have to be mega politically correct about everything that comes out and you do at your point too that you have to choose your words so carefully and, and you are a little less. Oh, I, I, I stopped. I, I stopped choosing my words. <laughs> right. people, we're under the. People I'm under the microscope to... constantly, and sometimes I slip yeah. up and say something I'm not supposed to. And I oh, I, like I, I, I purposely do it. I, I, I try to bring it down to the gutter sometimes because mm -hmm. that's the only way you can get through to some people. Yeah. You know, so you know, they just want it, it, and a lot of the guys love it when I do it. I, I mean, I, I'm not gonna go out and actively bash a company for no reason at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what. That that this is about that pen that uh, I gave you that, that that live liner. I don't think I've ever really fully mentioned this in any of my videos. I started to, but then I kind of cut it out and was gonna save it for later. But what's very interesting about Pen sending me three of their brand spanking new reels that aren't even gonna be released until October, um, knowing full well that I'm not a fan of their product. Usually... That's amazing. So let me ask you. I don't know if you don't have to tell me. You don't have to. Was that pen itself sending you, or was it a local rep sending it to you? Uh, no, it was, uh, well, just to give you an idea, this is what makes it even more interesting. So I'm a moderator on Stripers Online, have been for quite a few years. Stripers Online's a huge fishing forum. 
Right. I, I imagine and people that are listening to this are actually this isn't the average YouTube yokel that doesn't know what a stripe you know stripers online. They just want yeah, to know where. Okay. I think a lot yeah. of these people are going to be pretty well. You know, so go ahead. So stripers but online. Yeah, I, I go by Scooby Doo over there. I've been the fixture there for a decade, and Penn has their own forum there. And they kind of hinted at some of the new reels coming out, and I was like, wow, that looks pretty good. Uh, long story short, I was gearing up for videos for iCast, and I didn't see Penn offer me one of their reels. And somebody shot me a private message a month and a half later saying, hey, did you see Tony from Penn offered you a couple of the spin fishers? I was like, oh, wow, no, I didn't see that. So I reached out to Penn. And at that point in time, I was kind of transitioning that I no longer wanted to take reels from um, you know, viewers, because I got a couple threats, because some of the videos I put out are damaging to these businesses, and some of them actually get right. kind of nasty. So, so I was the, getting a little... lot of people don't realize how careful we have to be, because you never know. We might end up somebody like us. It's absolutely in the realm of possibility for a lawsuit to end up on our on our doorstep for slander. Like I'm kind of careful, like on my YouTube channel, of what I end up saying, and like this might end up heading us here. But like I, there's a lot of brands I really don't like and have problems with, uh, you know, just the, who they are as a company in this fishing industry and the kayak fishing industry in particular. And I'm like kind of cautious how off the cuff I go on, on YouTube and keep it politically correct. What, do you have a fear of that? Like also? Uh, no, because everything is through personal experience. And if I can't speak through personal experience, I don't bring it up. I don't like, you know, I, I've in, a, in, in the past, I've, I've actually edited out edited out some conjecture that um, may get me in trouble, but at the same time, if it's not my personal experience, why do I want to share it? You know, I, you know, I, I can make predictions. I can right. say certain things might do this, this, and this. But if I I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of like, you know accusing a brand of something. Mm -hmm. But you know, back back on this this whole pen thing, which I think your guys might find interesting. Uh, it was one of those things that when I switched from taking reels from my subscribers for fear of there being uh, <laughs> um, a bomb in a box, <laughs> I, I decided that, you know what? If I ask a company for a product, I'm going to ask for everything. So I reached, I replied to Penn, or I reached out to them because he said it publicly and I was sending it via private message. I asked for everything. I told them the new Conflict 2 long cast reels looked very nice. I like the way they look on paper. The new spin fish, the new spin fishes look brilliant. And I asked for every single one of them. And the only thing I got was, I'll see what I can do. And that was it. And then I was at blue, uh, Blueberry Picking with the girlfriend, came back. There's a big box a couple days later. Had no idea what it was. I was actually, she didn't order anything. I didn't order anything. So I'm like, whoa, what is this? Is, were my fears coming to fruition? <laughs> was this the bomb in the box? And I pick it up, I see pure fishing on it. I'm like, son of a bitch, look at that. There you go. So I, I crack the box. I'm like, wow, look at all these brands making new reels. I'm like, all right, this is cool. I'm, I'm game. So that's how I got those reels. I'm not I'm not going to bat for pen. I've been critical. Right. I love and, and if my reel, my spin fisher that you gave me, if it shits the bed in this next month, granted I'm on downtime with this hurricane, oh, we're going to go to town. I will absolutely. Well, actually, I just want to stop you right there. <laughs> there is something to be said that these are pre-retail production reels. So when they when they build these prototypes, they got to get them out for ICAST. They don't have them ready two years in advance. They, you know, the, the industry isn't that, um, I don't want to say wealthy, where they can do these things five years in advance and just hold on to stuff. I mean, the, the projects come quick, and they have to be released you know, you know, there's a target release date, and they have to hit those targets. So the reels that were sent to me were pre-production. They were displays on uh, down at iCast or given out just to show uh, dealers and such. So certain things that may not be 100% dialed in, like on the reel that I sent you, the ball bearings and the side plates that are held in by three screws, that kind of sandwich is sealed between the bearing and the side, the side plate. Those screws, while they were tight, they weren't tightened all the way, which meant there was a little bit of extra play in the bearings. So before I sent that reel out, I had to tear that reel down and get it 100% mm -hmm. because I knew what the hell you were going to be doing to it, and I didn't want to have that reel fail out of, out of the box. Now, it was buttery smooth, almost Shimano smooth, almost Shimano Nasky, Saragossa, Stratic smooth, but you give it a little bump on the side of the knob, and all of a sudden it went geary, and it stayed geary. You pull that handle out a little bit, just grab it by the joint and kind of pull it out a little bit. 
It was super smooth. Give it a bump again. It was geary. That took me three hours to dial in what the hell is going on with it before it was sent down to you. So it's not Penn's fault. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. If this reel fails, it wasn't a perfect specimen. But if it survives, that tells me even more that it has the potential to be, without a doubt, one of the best uh, bait running reels on the market. And that also says that the Spinfisher standard version also has the potential to be at the 150 price point, uh, the one best. best and, and you can go out on Amazon right now for 111 bucks buy a spin fisher with a rod uh, pre-order, which that's, is disgusting. That's, that's absurd. Yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll talk about that for another time. Is how Amazon will, <laughs> is is, yeah. is quietly. Or as I like to call it Alibaba Zon because it's right. turned into Alibaba with a million different brands. You can't even pronounce their name. They're just some different language of the word. Right, but anything that Amazon is really getting their hands on, and in terms of the fishing industry, and they're, they're secretly and quietly doing it. You know, going directly to manufacturers. And oh, and there are manufacturers. The... You heard it here first. You heard it here first publicly. There are manufacturers that have very tight price restrictions that have stores on Amazon that you don't know about. So when when the I average person goes into store, that. yeah, when the average person goes into a store and wants to buy a, per, a product, most manufacturers give their 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 shops that they're retailing to a certain price point. They cannot sell below this price. That is part so of the yeah, agreement. Map. Amazon yeah, routinely violates this agreement because Amazon just basically says, fuck you, I'm Amazon. You need me more than I need you. Dude, that pen slammer you bought for $150, it should be sold for, what, 250 and up? Right. I know, I know shops that were trying to sell them at, like, 20 below map that had people from Penn, you know, hey, you, you, can't, you can't violate map on this product. And then Amazon selling it for a hundred dollars less, and you know just to give you an idea, that affiliate link, that sold a hundred reels inside of a week. One hundred, they were out of stock. They replenished their stock, sold out, replenished again, sold out, all violating Map. That's crazy, and that's the that, scary part. And it's uh, a lot of shops probably might not under. I mean, some do, but a lot of these fishing, a lot of shops just have no, are not really understanding that yeah. this is. Th those shops will never get that customer. Yeah. It, it, it really is sad. Yeah, that's, and you know, I, 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 I get to support local. I, I get both sides of the argument, though. You know, support local if you can, if you can afford it. But, you know, if you save a hundred dollars on a reel, you can buy thirty dollars in eels. Yeah, that's you know, that kind of it, it's it's like a double edged sword. But, you know, it, it's 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 the industry is. I mean, you have talked about the industry ad nauseum. This is yeah. gonna be an hour and a half long podcast yeah, yeah. going off about so, that. All right, so we got another five minutes. So I want to just, <laughs> um, and I think this is a fa fascinating subject: is how Amazon will eventually really make it an even bigger hey, footprint. Dude, if you got no place to go, we can go into all you want, bro. We're, we're gonna, <laughs> but um, yeah, I actually don't have anywhere to go right now. But um, anyway, that's that, all kidding aside. Uh, I want to keep them at a half hour, but um. The uh, so I wanted to, you. You said you had a couple of questions that you, from as somebody, a viewer of mine, that is not as in tune that you thought were really interesting about what I do, because you're you know you're a boat fisherman, a surf fisherman, kayak fisherman to a degree, but not like how I am. So I wanted to give you as somebody who's a viewer that a lot of viewers have questions, um, ask a couple of questions about what I do, and let's keep this one shorter. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what, one of the things I mentioned and we, we talked about briefly and we wanted to save it for this is as a boater, you know, running the Northeast, you know, New York, Raritan Bay, that kind of bite. When when I'm in a center console, whether it's a 20 footer or a 30 footer, there's just something about you guys and your dick sleds that disappear between these. He swells. means kayaks for those, right? <laughs> and again, I'm a kayaker, too. I, I, I just don't have the stones to take it out Oceanside. I, because I can't tell you how many times where some, the, the guy at the wheel is watching. I'm outside in a, in a, in a Hydrosport Vector, you know, 30 foot center console, weighs 12,000, 13,000 pounds, a monster center console. We run it offshore tuna. We're trying our best to keep an eye out. All of a sudden, out of the blue, there's a kayaker with a flag that's two feet tall and he thinks he's doing everything right. And he's in a dark blue kayak or a dark green kayak. When the, when the water looks like it's oil, because when it's an overcast day, it just looks like an oil slick as far as you can see, and you're disappearing in swells, we come up on you doing 25, 30 knots, which is not even, you know, half throttle. You know, it's one of those things that 
from that perspective. And you've been in boats too, so you know this too. Right. And what I know, goes through your mind? What, like, where, where do you draw the line? Are, are do you plan your trips uh, accordingly? I because... always assume I'm going to get hit by a boat. Whenever I am in a certain area, if a boat, I always assume a boat cannot see me. Doesn't matter if I have a flag. Doesn't matter anything. So whenever you're fishing an area and you're transitioning into ocean side fishing. Um, typically, a lot of these incidents does your, does your girlfriend know that you always plan to get hit by a boat? <laughs> yeah, I, I really try not to talk much about it anyway. <laughs> but um, there's certain areas that are always hot spots. And I always say, if a boat hits a kayak with a full range of vision while running under steam in a certain direction for you know more than a minute or two, that boater, doesn't matter the swells, absolutely had the time to survey the area. It's the times yeah. that the boater does not have enough time to fully survey an area while in swells, white caps, lots of things are going on, sandbars, jetties. This is the only time I can ever say that this excuse is absolutely 100% understandable. So now the, the responsibility comes under the kayak to absolutely know the inlet that they're fishing near, that they're around. Hold on, I have to refresh. We went over our time. But anyway, um, we um, the inlet that they're, they're fishing around, they absolutely need to know this. What is the hot spot? What is the corner? Where do the boats fly around? Um, so, for example, Rockaway Inlet, where I used to live, there was two entrances to get back into Rockaway Inlet from the ocean. And I didn't transverse this inlet very often. There was the quick way, which would take me around Breezy Point Jetty, and I could just cut across from the ocean through the inlet and channel. That had all the boat traffic. I absolutely never went this way. I always did the mile and a half extra run because I knew the boats wouldn't do the extra mile and a half run. And I did that for my absolute safety. Here in the Carolinas, there's a couple of inlets that are same deal. There's an inlet that I'm like, I never, I might ch take it out early in the morning. On a weekend, I'll never come back through it. I'm just that cautious. And, you know, inlets seem kind of practical to most kayak anglers because of the fact that it's like the quickest access to fish the ocean. And there's absolutely the times that I don't want to make it downplay to say that it's um, it's the kayaker's fault. There's absolutely times that the boaters aren't paying attention. But when See, my issue with that is, is who, so when you're dead, who tells the judge Boater should have been paying attention. Right, no, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I default to, brother. Yeah. No, and uh, but it's and um, I, I, you know I'm not, I'm not the I'm, I'm not I don't have the stones for that kind of stuff. But I've been in some shit before, 100 miles offshore overnight and coming back through the storm that you know of the stench century. You know I've been in some some serious. I shit. mean, the, the, and the reason you probably see so much fucking head shake on my camera when I'm fishing out there is because I'm always constantly surveying my health. area. I'm not right. just looking oh, yeah. at my lap or you know my rod. And as much of a better viewing experience that is, it's because I'm constantly looking over my left and right. Always when I'm out there, is yeah. what am I doing? Where am I? You know. So that's a big thing, absolutely. And you know the other thing we talked about briefly is. You know, I, I fish weekends occasionally, but I don't fish the same areas I fish on the weekend as I do during the week. And a lot of these, you know, real hot spots that get clipped and run over, it's, it involves a lot of that weekend traffic where it's like things are really out of control. Um, you know, as kayak anglers, kayak anglers should always have a plan of what's the weekend friendly spots and what's the weekday friendly spots to avoid the high areas of boat traffic that are potentially really dangerous. And that's tough to figure out. It, that will come in time with experience. You know, you go somewhere and um, there's like, I absolutely have a list of no way in hell places on a weekend I fish that I will never. No, that's, that's interesting to see that, that I, I never realized that thought process goes into your decision. I don't know if it goes into everybody, every kayak. I absolutely have a list of, I will never go there on a weekend. Interesting. Yeah, I, I have. A and, and and you know, it, you know I'm I saying don't even say this in a video. I don't even tell you what day of the week it is. But like, I have because nobody cares about like that kind of stuff on the video. Um, but like in, in terms of reality, I have a list of absolutely no way at how long we can. No, that's that's very interesting. It's it's just one of those things that I I always want to know. And again, and again I I guarantee not every kayaker is out there as like, much as you are. For example, all right here in the Carolinas, I don't mess with the intracoastal waterway at all on a weekend. Period. Hmm. In the Carolinas. 
up in New York. Oh, that was, I, I didn't mess with 95% of the stuff on the week, but there was a lot of places I made sure never to mess with on the weekend. Oh, I mean, I'll tell you what, man, on, on days like by the, by the kills, Jamaica Bay off the hook, all that kind of stuff, backside of the hook down through Belmar. It was always amazing to see, like, I've seen kayakers anchored up in the channels, you know, in Shark well, River. I, I, I don't know sport. what goes through those guys' heads when they're anchoring up. Like I wouldn't even anchor up a center console in those areas. Right, <laughs> for that, fair, like a log kayaks. coming through and grabbing the anchor open submarine in it. It's like, holy Jesus, these guys I, are I don't crazy. want to be bashing people left and right, but, like, yeah, I know. You see that stuff, and everyone's no, like. No, it's not about that. Yeah, no, but it's like a lot of guys just end up. I don't understand why somebody decides they're going to anchor up on a kayak. I mean, one of the beauty, beautiful things about fishing on a kayak is you don't need to anchor. A spe- a, you really don't need to ever anchor on your kayak because you could do such controlled short drifts that are kind of impossible to do on a boat sometimes, especially when you're targeting bottom fish. Um, I don't even the paddle guy kayaks around here that I know don't anchor ever. So it's uh, when the guy decides to anchor in a channel with a kayak, I'm always like, what is, what, what you know? <laughs> it, gotta get you know, that, gotta get that keeper fluke. <laughs> it's, but no, but it's a lack of experience mostly. It really is that, the, you know, they didn't know that, you know, there's more efficient ways and safer ways to fish. So, no, no, you're, you're, you're right. And it's, it's just, just one of those things I just wanted to know, like your perspective. It's, yeah, it's I, interesting I, I, to hear. We got time for one more before I want to wrap this one up. One more question. Uh, how come you don't do much freshwater bass fishing? So uh, what's interesting about freshwater, that is my absolute weakest. Like, I, saw, I have zero confidence that. I'm actually pretty weak at a couple of these, like, popping cork redfish. I'm not good at it either yet. I'm just, I'm just slowly. Bass, to me, is a fishery I never had any exposure in in New York City. That's the problem. There was, there was a couple of ponds in the, you know, Brooklyn and... <sighs> Queens. See, up, up, up in that area where, you know, Ithaca area where I see some of your trout my, my, videos. That's where my parents live, right. And to me, you I was already... world-class smallmouth bass fishing. does. But to me, I was already, like, I'm more interested in... I think lake trout is one of the most under... I think the two most underrated... Three most underrated fish in the, uh, in the, in the water are lake trout, black drum, and barracuda. That's my current three most underrated fish ever. But... Um, you're a Laker. I, you're a Lake Trout fan. So Lake you're, Trout. you're a Lakers fan. I, lo- I love Lake Trout. I think it's one of the best, uh, most underrated fisheries ever. It really? Does, what do you like about them? I'm just curious because I, don't, I, I never found them to be good fighters sport-wise until they get up on the surface and they just wrap themselves up on your line. To me, like weak fish. I mean, I love weak fish. Yeah. Lake Trout is the weak fish of freshwater. So you're looking at sport or table fare? Sport. Okay. No, that's inter- I mean, I used to jig up some of the biggest Lakers out around Valley for years way way before the internet was a thing i was i was i was dropping down 12 inch baits you know jigging 75 feet of water pulling up 14 50 pound lakers back in the late 90s early 2000s and i i moved away from that so it's interesting to hear that that's one of your preferred fish that's 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 pretty cool i mean they're fun in the winter i love i like them during the summer too i mean they remind me of weak fish and you know gray trout that they're you know they require a certain degree of skill and you know not everyone does it a little tricky but it's something i got better at over it took me a while to get at least a little more comfortable i'd say but i find them to be really a lot of fun so you like them more than those beastly brown trout you would get damn you know what is i could get more numbers i don't have to troll okay. but brown trout are tough to jig on on the open water like that they're really tough to i have a hard time jigging them on open water i got you i got you no it's that's interesting i mean I, brown trout are one of my favorites I, mean, oh, I love brown trout too, but uh, I mean, like, just the lake trout, I can get on consistently with the jig bite, you know. No, that's cool. Uh, that's so cool. It's, it's kind of interesting. But um, anyway, uh, what was the last thing I want to say? So I think that's going to wrap it up. I hope uh, I'm going to listen to this and do some editing, to make sure there's nothing that's really stupid. But um, yeah, this is the first of many uh, podcasts and guests. I think this is the format we're going to continue to do, just off the cuffs kind of stuff. I will change this green screen. Um, to something that we just really pieced this together at the last second. I don't know. I don't like the, all the photos of myself. And both, you know, Nick, <laughs> you, you think it's fine, but I'm like, oh, it's too much for, of me. For, for the audience that's made it this far, let's, let's put Elias in the spot. Is this a good green screen? Do you mind Elias is bugging the pictures? I don't mind it. It's it's, it's Elias's channel. He, he yeah. deserves it. He but puts I, the like time I said, in. He, I hope, I hope we can continue a different program as opposed to just the straight <laughs> stupidity of YouTube fishing and providing real value. You know, this this wasn't that well constructed of exact topic stuff to talk about, but we uh, 
we definitely covered some really relevant information within this half hour. So um, hope we, we're gonna. I'm gonna try to record a couple more. Try to get a little better at it. Um, and you know, I'll, you're always invited back on whenever I figure out. We're gonna get a cool. kind of regular well, thing now, going. Um, now, what I will ask you is, when you have some of your guests, give me a heads up on who's coming on because I can. I, I will actually like to jump on if you give me the mic a little bit to ask a few questions because from I, my perspective, I might do some solo podcast time. too where I do just Q and A that I've had where some things that maybe it's just me best talking about too so um i'll definitely do mix it up too and i as soon as i get better at this interwebs maybe we could have multiple people and like yeah like you said is just this is this is the start so just trying to hopefully but, but, get a good impression quick. go ahead i just wanted to finish one thing I, I get a lot of questions i can't answer them all because i don't have the experience in certain aspects like mm -hmm. you'll you, you're gonna have a guy coming in that's you know a, a, a tog master what gear no, no spoiler prefer. i don't want to tell you about the time <laughs> <laughs> but you know that kind of stuff you know if yeah. i could you know ask a couple of questions about the gear used that way i could pass that information along as well That's because true. again i'm the gear channel i re i get three thousand to four thousand emails this isn't even including comments on videos i get thousands of emails right I so do i and i try to answer every single one of them and if i can't i feel bad so it's one of those things that, hey, if I can get some insight from one of your guests, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. All right. Um, let me see what else. So, yep. Um, so that was kind of like the pilot. I mean, the listeners, if you really enjoy this, I do have a Patreon link in the video's description. Um, you know, if you're, you know, two ways I know if, you know, if I really should continue doing this is, you know, if the viewership is up, uh, is up there and it, the numbers are up that people are liking it or the Patreon contributions are up there. That's how I know I should continue spending my time on these podcasts. They will take a significant time, amount of time for me to put together, but if absolutely there is an audience for it that enjoys what I'm saying, that enjoys the kind of information I'm putting out there, make sure I know. Make sure I know either through Patreon or if I'm getting the consistent viewership that I need to continue doing this and that my my voice in this kind of way is worth the time. So what do you think? Is it, am I, did I hit the, the nail on the head with that? No, I, I do. I, I think that was a, a pretty good way of putting it. I yeah. mean, this stuff ain't free. Yeah, it, no, it, costs, it, it, it ain't free, but I need money. to know that, you know, I'm not wasting time trying to do this. And I thought this yeah, is a I, good idea. And listen, I'm not the first one coming up with this podcast idea. Um, there were a couple of kayaker anglers over here in, um, in Virginia. Um, Lee and Kayak Kevin were the first couple of guys that came up with the idea. They were a little bit ahead of their time. Um, and there's other guys doing fishing podcasts. I'm definitely not the first, but maybe I'm the, you know, one of the more recent guys to pick it up and try to give it another go out of the kayak fishing realm or just I, I real just, fishing I realm. I just focus on what you want to do. Yep. And that's what it comes so, down to. If, if you want to share it, even if it doesn't get, you know, a thousand views to start, just keep doing it. Yep. It's, and it, that's, that's, that's what we're do. doing. It's a realm of specific type of fishing that I enjoy and I have some knowledge in and, it's, you know, other people are interested in learning more. So. I thank you all for joining me. I uh, thank Tackle Advisors, parting comments. Um, you know, uh, absolutely, I have your, well, I put his, um, his YouTube channel in the description. Um, just check it out, too, if you like what he does. He's definitely one of a kind. Um, so I think that's Oh, gee, got. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. So I'm going to try to, during this downtime, I'm going to try to ruffle up a couple more guests. Um, and then uh, hopefully we can get a once a week upload is what I'm get, I'm kind of hoping for, um, maybe twice a week. And we'll try to change up the subjects and guests as we go along. So uh, I think that's all for me. I'm signing out. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Later, guys. Sweet. What do you think? Uh, hopefully that was concise to, to a degree.